wine He can make the lame walk He can make me talk And open up the eyes of the blind Come on, help us sing it now Let's all go down to the river There's a man, he's walking on the water Come along with me What I want to see That man walking on the water Play it, Danny. Come on, guys. Jesus is the man river and he's washing people's sins away he can save your soul if you give him trouble get ready for that judgment day let's all go down to the river there's a man he's walking on the water come along with me So much worship man you may now please be seated oh no it's okay <laughs> good morning y'all welcome 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 it's so glad i'm so 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 glad that we have a lot of people today i am very very happy and excited Thank you all for being here today on this beautiful Sunday mor morning to worship together. It's always, always just so great to worship with your church family, right? Now, my name is Hazel Baker. For those who are new here at Western Heritage Church and a part of the welcome team here at uh, this wonderful um, church home that we have. And I would like you all to, I would like to invite you all to connect with us. We are entering this new digital era. So if you could please take your phones out and um, go to your web browser and type in cowboychurchirving.org. I repeat, that's cowboychurchirving.org. It will take you to our website. And we can get connected digitally now through our website. Yahoo! Thank you! <laughs> in the world of Facebook, we have CowboyChurchIrving.org, right? And we can get connected if you select the drop-down menu on the top left. Top. My top right. I'm sorry. That's my Asian thing. <laughs> Directionally challenged. So on your top right part of your website, you, there's a drop-down menu, and you will see the connect part. And drop us your information. Let us know how we can get to know each other better. It's always nice. You know, we could be your church family, so who knows, right? And while you're there, drop us your prayer request. There's nothing too big or too small for our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Now our children are going to get dismissed right after the tithing. Just want to make sure that I put it out there. And now to begin today's service, I would be reading from this, uh, today's scripture is from the book of Psalms, chapter 104, verses 31, 32, 33, and 34. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. 
And for the morning prayer, I would like to invite Pastor Jody. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, uh, Hazel, thank you for so warmly welcoming uh, and inviting us to be in the gathering, the community of faith, either in person and church online. As we take a moment to have a prayer, reflection, and meditation, in just a moment, I'll invite you to join me in sharing the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, and I hope that I don't mess up on some of the lines. So all of you who grew up learning that, feel free to jump right in and be sure to uh, help Pastor Jody out. Father, as we begin to now share the Lord's Prayer, we ask that you speak to our hearts about one of the most wonderful prayers ever prayed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Ben, let's play some more songs of worship. You guys will know this. Sing along.
just a closer walk with thee. Just a closer walk, just a closer walk. Granted, Jesus is my just a closer walk. Seems like it's a weekly thing, but we're going to have Mike share a, another original song with us this week, and it's called At the Foot of the Cross. You guys enjoy. When the weight of the world is on my shoulder. church. How are you this morning? Just so I wouldn't look like Pastor Jody this morning, I wore my Rangers t-shirt under my denim shirt because after yesterday's performance, they need all the help they can get. I uh, 
listen to the first inning, doing well, two to nothing against um, Houston. Went outside, came back in, ninth inning, nine to two. All right. This morning's stewardship scripture is 1 Corinthians 16.2. On the Lord's day, each of you should put aside something from what you have earned during the week and use it for this offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. The Feast of First Fruits was established when Moses was leading the Israelites and they were wandering the land without a food supply chain. The, a feast was observed in faith that God would provide and secure his people to the promised land. When we purpose each day by intentionally taking the first few minutes of the morning to pray and talk with God, when we purpose our talents to help others, even when our own to-do task is long, and when we purpose our giving each week by intentionally setting aside from our first fruits and return it back to God, we have liberated our hearts from the bond of the world, the clock, and finances. This morning, by returning our first fruits to our church, we recognize we are blessed. Is it a proclamation that God is first in our lives and that we trust in him alone? Giving time at WHC is a joyous celebration of our relationship with God. Each Sunday, the band plays an upbeat tune, and the finance team encourages you to celebrate and take part of the joy and experience a liberated heart in what trusting God will do. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, you are a gracious Father, and we thank you for your unbound love and you bringing us together this morning to hear your word. We ask for your presence and directions on our lives, and may our minds be aligned with Christ. Give us the discipline to set aside from our first fruits every day in an expression of love, trust, and discipleship. We ask for your blessing on our offering this morning and guide us to steward it according to your will. Bless those in our congregation suffering from illness or in need of your encouragement. Protect each of us as we leave here today and go about our week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us trust God and do good.
Good morning again. Wow, we've got a, a lopsided deal. We need about eight or ten to balance it out. Good morning. Good to see everyone. Have you ever felt you were left out to dry in a situation? Yes. All of us have, of course. None of us are without being left out to dry sometimes, we feel. Maybe a sense of abandonment. Maybe a sense of turning the back. We've all had that moment, I'm sure, a time or two. Did you know Jesus had that moment? Did you know that Jesus cried out to God in, the, in deep pain, why did you turn your back on me? Jesus said that. And, of course, most of us know he said that from one of the most painful, one of the most excruciating moments of his earthly life while he was hanging on the cross. Now, Jesus made seven different sayings while he hung on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. But the most horrific one that compels Bible students to dive deeper and deeper and deeper into gaining clarity and perspective and understanding 
of why Christ died on the cross is this cry he made asking God why did he turn his back on him. You see in your notes, we're going to have a topic regarding why did Jesus really die on the cross? Why did he? Now, most of us would say, and we would be correct, well, he died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And everyone says, amen. That is so true. But why? Why did we need our sins forgiven? So, what I'm going to do today is more instructional than necessarily from a point of motivation or inspiration, though when you get proper instruction, it should inspire you. It should compel you to even be more motivated to continue growing in your relationship with Christ. Or for someone today, be in person or online, maybe for the first time you start your relationship with Christ and especially you make sure you start it with Christ, start off on the right foot. Now, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. We'll have the picture up on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the screens, and we're going to look at verses uh, 45. Lisa will go through 50. We're going to go through 45. We'll start at 45, and we'll go through 50. And you'll highlight verse 45 and 46, especially 46 is the cry that Jesus made in his most, again, agonizing moment of excruciating pain uh, at the hands experiencing the most horrific uh, capital punishment ever known to mankind, and that is, as you know, the crucifixion. No other religion has a Savior who went to the cross. No other religion has a Savior who was sacrificed on the cross, who was buried in the grave, was raised from the dead on the third day. Listen to me. If you ever wrap your mind around Christian faith, if you ever believe that in the beginning God, who had no beginning, who has no end, if you ever believe that God can take some dust and form the very life existence of man and woman and then breathe into them, if you ever believe that, and that's what Genesis teaches, then God himself can raise up whoever he from the dead. Do I have a witness? Amen. And this is not, oh, yeah, 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 root, root, root. it's not this kind of stuff. Uh, it, it, it's high fives, yes. But we're talking about the truth. Authentically, historicity, based on historical data, the resurrection is a real deal. Even secular, non-Bible-believing folks record and give testimony. Where's his body? It has not been found to this day. Why? There's no body to be found. He is at the throne room of grace right now praying for you, praying for me. The Bible says he's ever interceding, spending time at the throne room of grace preparing for us. So I want us to highlight verse 45, 46, especially take note there uh, and highlight. And then we'll read 47, 48, 49, and verse uh, 50. All right, let me get my... You'll notice lately I'm typing it out in bigger font. Because my print in my small Bible, it's hard for these progressive lens to connect with it. And I don't want to change Bibles just yet and go to a bigger font because I'm too spoiled to my highlights here. And so, so I'm reading it. Okay, verse 45. From noon, 12 o'clock, lunchtime, until 3 p.m. in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. How many had a moment last Monday? With the solar eclipse. I mean, Chill Bump City, two times for me. Incredible. 
Incredible. However, this was not a solar eclipse moment. This was a supernatural, even apocalyptic moment to where globally God shut it down for three hours to depict darkness that is the judgment of God upon whoever was on that cross. And we know that it was Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. So that's the backdrop. About three in the afternoon, notice Jesus' prayer. In Aramaic, he says, Eli, Eli, lama, bath- lama, <laughs> lama sabacha, sabathani. I'm getting it right. I'm speaking in tongues. The tongues of a language, Aramaic. Eli, Eli, lama sabacha, sab- sabathani. Sabathani. Everybody phonetically say it with me. Sabathani. Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabathani. Which means, which means, and your text should say it, read it with me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, isn't that really, when you just take a moment, it's quite arresting, isn't it? Why would Christ express from the very depths of pain? Why would he even acknowledge when the Bible says in Numbers that God wants to make his face shine upon you? Why would would God, why would Jesus accuse God of turning his back on him? Look at verse 47. When some of those standing around heard this, they said, he's calling out Elijah. They heard the prefix Eli, Eli, and they thought maybe he's calling out for one of the former uh, prophets who performed miracles in the Old Testament. So verse 48, immediately one of them, someone had mercy here. They took a sponge uh, and they filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now verse 49. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. That's just like some. Let's see something sensational. We really don't care what his pain is. Let's see if somebody comes along and does a miracle so we can have this uh, emotional, sensational, sensationalized especially and call it being church. Terrible misrepresentation. Verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out in a what kind of voice? He then did what? On Sunday morning, Easter, two Sundays ago, we introduced throughout the month of April and May this idea that we're going to, through this time frame, look at some signs that Dr. David Jeremiah gave us, and we're going to highlight some of those. One of the significant signs that Jesus Christ was, uh, was raised from the dead was the very fact that his body could not be found, but the fact that there are many witnesses that he did die and that his body was placed in the tomb. No if and ands and buts about it. There's all kinds of objections, of course. But Jesus Christ died while hanging on the cross. Okay, at the top of your notes... Notice uh, our key verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now read 2 Corinthians 5.21 with me. The Apostle Paul is going to give reference to this text that we just read. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, Lisa, let's put that song up at the foot of the cross. As we were singing that song, I text Lisa and said, uh, be ready to let's look at that. When the weight of the world is on my shoulders, was the weight of the world on his shoulders? It was there. Look at the next. And my heart is aching, filled with pain and loss. Next. I just think of the one who paid the price for me. 
and I lay my burdens down. Where? At the foot of the cross. Let's look at another. At the foot of the cross, at the foot of the cross, for my sins, sweet Jesus paid the cost. He's the road to salvation without him. And everyone says, I'd be lost. Now, today we're going to look at three things the cross teaches as to why Jesus Christ died on the cross. We're going to answer why. And we're going to get more instructional. How many of you remember in your school days, you had vocabulary tests and spelling words to uh, remember meanings and definitions and spell, right? How many of you did pretty good with spelling and all? You're thinking, don't raise your hand, Jody. Uh, I did pretty good. Uh, uh, how many of you enjoyed those pop quiz of vocabulary words and tests? Well, today I'm going to introduce to you probably two words that's not necessarily in your everyday vocabulary. A third word is going to be more recognizable. But each of these words are going to convey, if you were in a Bible class, what professors are going to teach us as to the why Jesus Christ died on the cross. So the first word we want to look at is a word called expiation. It's on the screen, E-X-P-I-A-T-I-O-N. The second word I want you to put in your notes is a word called propiation. Propiation. I know it. They're tongue twisters and we're speaking in tongues with expiation and propiation. The third word is reconciliation. Now, there's a word we're much more familiar with. We understand what it feels like and what it is in experiencing being alienated or separated. And, oh, we're more... Uh, uh, we experience more meaning and purpose and inspiration when our relationships can be brought back together in oneness. But that first word, expiation, that second word, propriation, without those two words, you don't have reconciliation. Got it? So let's tackle them just a moment. So get your academic minds ready for a second or two. We won't overly belabor the point, but we're going to highlight a few things. And I have a few more notes in your notes so that you can ponder these things throughout the week in your devotional studies. And that's going to set us up. We'll look at three more next Sunday. So let's look at the word expiation. It's a word that means the removal of, and, and especially in the context of the New Testament, the removal of sin and guilt. For your sins to go through expiation, the, the sacrifice Christ made on the cross, his death removes and expiates our sin and our guilt. The guilt of our sin was taken away from us and placed on Christ. Uh, scoot back up to the top of your notes and look at 2 Corinthians 5.21 and read that again with me. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All right? So expiation is a term that means when Christ... Uh, gave his life on the cross, his sacrifice removes our sin, and not simply our sin, but the guilt of our sin. Okay? Now, the guilt of our sin was taken away and placed, uh, taken away from us, placed on Christ, who discharged it by his death. Look at John 129 at what John the Baptist said. The Lamb of God who takes away what? the sin of the world. This word expiation, another expanded meaning, means to cover sin and or to be cleansed from sin. So when a person invites Christ to come into their heart, they're not coming to Christ or being saved or being made a new creation because they prayed a prayer. Come on, help me out. 
Praying a prayer is an acknowledgement, of course, of the biblical truth. A person who is contemplating and thinking, I need to start a relationship with Christ, the very fact that you can think that way, God himself is enabling you and giving you the mind, the spirit, and the heart, and the soul to even think that you need to have a relationship with him. Why is that critically important? Because you cannot just turn over a new leaf and decide today, I want to follow God. You can't just do that. We do that in January. We all know we need to turn over some new leaves. And if we just will it enough and discipline enough and hard work in that, and, and will and discipline are, are very important uh, habits, healthy habits to have. But when it comes to having a relationship with Christ and going to heaven one day, it is nothing on us. It's all him. That's why Paul in Ephesians says, for by grace can a person be saved. Otherwise, they strut around and brag, and they become braggadocious like a peacock strutting around. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look what I can do. Look who I can be. Look how much Bible I know. Look how much I pray. It's always look, look, look. The ultimate of spiritual narcissism. Look, look, look. Look, look, look. That was the mindset of the religious Pharisees and Sadducees that literally put Jesus on the cross. Look at Isaiah 53, 6 in your notes. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Hebrew says he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So when you pray and you acknowledge, God, I'm a sinner. And I realize I need to come to faith in Christ. That can be a heartfelt, life-changing prayer. But it's all because of him. It's all because of him. And when he sacrificed his life at the cross, his sacrifice pleases God enough that God removes our sinful nature that is at odds with him and takes away the guilt of not being in a right relationship with him. Number two, procreation. Now, Expiation refers to the removal of our sins. Propriation, if you'll see in your notes, carries the basic idea of appeasement and satisfaction, especially toward God. It means it refers to the removal of God's wrath. It's one thing for God to forgive my sins. It's another thing for God to remove the guilt of my sin. But it's another thing for his wrath for the verdict, for the uh, gavel to come down in his judicial court and says, you are no longer going to receive my punishment, which his holy and righteous and justice must punish the sinful nature of disobedience and rebellion against God. When Adam and Eve created the ultimate plague of all humanity. When Adam and Eve let the family infrastructure down, they messed it up. But it could have been Jody and Kathy. It could have been your names. Humanity decided they did not need to follow God's way. And they allowed the slithering tactics and voices of deceptivity and distortions by the enemy, the devil himself, to whisper, did God really say? And when that happens to us, we're on very treacherous ground. And it can, it can become very, very disheartening and very, very dangerous. Propriation refers to the removal of God's wrath. In a sense, you are set free. Yes, your sins are forgiven. Yes, the guilt is no longer there. But also, no punishment. No punishment. Why? 
Because Christ dying in our place for our sins, he removed the wrath of God that we justly deserved. You see, God's wrath came on him. Listen to me. If you have not ever had a chance to watch the movie, The Passion of Christ, that Mel Gibson put together, demand yourself to watch how the Roman soldiers took the cat of nine tails, laced with little steel rods and rocks. Demand yourself to watch how the leather and those steel, those steel, steely balls and rocks and glass tore into his skin and ripped his body literally to shreds. There is no other picture on planet Earth that depicts an accurate uh, crucifixion of, of what a human body would go through at the hands of the Roman guards. When you look at that and you realize the Gospels teach Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice, then you have a picture of God's holy judgment that he would allow even the holy son of God to go through that type of crucifixion, torture, and punishment for you and for me. Look at 1 John 4, 9, 4, 10. If in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the Read, uh, say that word with me again, the propitiation for our sins. That is, the removal of no more punishment. The removal that his wrath no longer will punish you. Now, you see in your notes one step further? Now, I want you to really wrap your mind around this. Okay, I want you to get your noggin focused, get your brain to work in, and I want you to see one step further here. Look at it with me. Appropriation, that is, this biblical appropriation of removing God's wrath is not simply a sacrifice that removes his wrath, but a sacrifice that removes wrath and turns it into favor. See, it's not that God is no longer mad at you. We cannot interpret it like that. God removes his wrath, and then he wants his face to shine upon you with his favor. But notice the rest of the notes. However, watch this. Do you see it? Watch the rest of the notes. However, it turns it into favor. Look at your note. Propitiation does not turn wrath into his love. Why? Because God already fully loves even the most vilest sinner. Can I get a witness? Amen. That doesn't take away from his justice from within his judicial court. But even within his judicial court, he still has this eternal love toward the most vilest. Yet that love that he has, if the vile sinner does not turn from their wicked ways, God can never compromise his justice. Because sin must be paid for. And of course, Christ made that ultimate sacrifice on the cross. So look in your note there. Propitiation does not turn wrath into love. God already loved us fully, which is the reason Christ came to give his life on the cross. He turns his wrath into favor so that his love may realize its purpose in our lives that doing good and his doing good to us every day and in all things forever without sacrificing his justice and holiness. Continue to, even in your minds right now, acknowledge, man, I got to chew on this some more this week. It's good stuff, but I got to chew on it some more. I'm still chewing on it after many years of continue dissecting and exegeting and learning. Why is that always critically important? Because it will always move you away from you and get you into him. No matter, and, and 
we are to become seasoned veterans of the faith. We need seasoned, every church needs seasoned veterans. Every church also needs babies and toddlers. I'm talking about spiritually. We need teenagers as far as maturity in the faith. We need younger adults in the faith. And we need seasoned veterans in the faith. Notice I didn't say seasoned veterans on how long you've been a member of a church. You could be a member of a church 50 years but act like a toddler with respect to your emotional and spiritual maturity. Look at Hebrews 2.17. For this reason, he had to be made like them. That's Christmas time. Christ came. Christ came, incarnate, God, fully God, yet in fully man. He made to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make propitiation, or the word, many more translations use the word atonement, for the sins of the people. All right, let's look at the last one. Reconciliation. Okay, check out your notes there. Expiation refers to what? Removal of what? Propiation refers to the removal of what? God's wrath. Now, let's look at reconciliation. Reconciliation, what word would you fill in there? Reconciliation refers to the removal of our blank from God. A big A word. Alienation. Alienation. All of us know what it's like to have tension in relationships. Everybody go, oh, me. Oh, us. We also, when you work hard at it, oh, this is much better. Right? Come on now. Right? This is much better. I'd much rather have this kind of relationship than all that other junk. Right? I mean, oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, well, well, likewise, reconciliation, when Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice, he's saying you no longer have to be divorced. You no longer have to be estranged. You now can come into the most meaningful, life-changing relationship of all, and that is with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Unequivocally, my wife will tell you that the primary reason, the quality we have is because of what Christ has been working in us over all these years because both of us are wired, though I know all of y'all would agree she's much nicer than, than I. And I agree somewhat. There are times as with us all. You know, if, if uh, uh, I am telling you today, I am rebellious enough, hard-headed enough, can be mean enough, and yet I know there's some good in me that if Christ had not and is not still, when I wake up and through my day, if I do not work hard at staying in alignment with him instead of alienation, then it affects her and affects every other relationship. And then all of us sometimes, even at our best, we, we have these moments of uh, this reconciliation deal that becomes very, very challenging. Any couple younger in their years of marriage would ask me, give me a couple of points. Know him. Know him. Know him. Know him. Know him. I'm just repeating what the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote 13 of the how many books in the New Testament? How many books in the New Testament? How many in the Old? How many in the entire Bible? Let's go, scholars. 60 in the whole Bible? How many in the Old? Come on, Bible folks. How many in the New? And then in the new, how many did the Apostle Paul write? Okay, how many in the old? 30 what? 39. How many in the new? Listen, children, you will hear the books of the Bible. We love some. Okay, 27 
a total of 66. Out of the 27, the Apostle Paul wrote 13. And every one of those, either directly or by implication, he said that his goal, his ultimate goal in life was to know him better. And we're talking about a scholar among scholars as far as intelligence and IQ and skill sets and the way God used him. And yet he stayed fundamental and foundational to the most important discipline and habit in his life. And that was to work hard on his relationship with Christ. That's why he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29 and 30, that he expends all of his energy that he might grow and mature in his relationship with Christ. You want to love better? Learn about his love. You want to have more joy? Learn about his joy. Love, joy, peace. You want, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. Reconciliation. Look at Romans 5, 10, and 11. If for a while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his what? By the third day resurrection, right? That's why the great hymn of faith sings, I serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. I know that he is living, no matter what men may say, right? I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, He's always near. Why? Because of what he did on the cross to remove not only our sin, but the guilt. To remove not only the sin and the guilt, but to remove the punishment. He was willing to take on that punishment. And then, of course, to remove the fact that we no longer have to be alienated from Christ. Let's close. Look at your last section titled Ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new what has come? Everyone say it with me. The new creation has come. The what has gone? The old self. And the new is here. Look at the rest of the text. All this is from who? All this, the fact that you can be a new person today, is all God. Now, you're not a robot, and God gives you the intelligence and the courage and the strength to humble yourself and pray, I want to invite you, Heavenly Father, Christ, I want to. And you pour out a few of those words in humility because you come to a greater clarity and perspective today that you need Him as your personal Savior and Lord. Look at verse 19. I meant uh, verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of what? So why does uh, WHC exist? We exist to grapple with these truths and in our journey, we want to share it with others. That's why we invite people to church. Not because we got it all together, but we know who has it all together. And that's Christ Jesus himself. The text goes on to say, we are therefore ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Everybody say that last statement with me. Be reconciled to God. Don't leave today in person or online. Don't leave and be estranged and alienated any longer. Come back into a peaceful relationship that God wants to have with you through Jesus Christ. Look at 21. Let's read it again. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Would you bow your heads with me? Your hearts are bowed. In just a moment, when the band gets in their place, they are going to begin a few chords of music so that you can even more so 
let that symbolize how that God wants your heart to be in tune with Him and in harmony with Him. Have you ever asked Jesus Christ to remove your sinful nature and change you? Have you ever thanked God that He did not punish you with His wrath and you thanked Him because you prayed and invited Him to come into your heart? Have you ever thanked God or prayed to ask God that you want to have a relationship with Him, not to be separated anymore? You want to come back to Him? I'm going to invite anyone A couple of Sundays ago, we had a celebration service of baptism. We'll have another one coming up over the next four to six weeks. For the first time, maybe there's a clarity in your mind like no other time before. You've heard maybe for the first time how Jesus cried out, and acknowledge that God is holy, righteous, and just. And he must punish. His wrath must punish the sinful rebellion of the human soul. And Jesus was willing to become that punishment. So maybe for the first time, maybe like no other, you're ready to invite him into your heart. You're ready to leave here today with a lighter step, with more bounce, with more, with more fervor, with more uh, enthusiasm and inspiration and energy and passion, not simply based on emotionalism at all, and yet in the depth of your very soul, there's emotion welling up even right now. Because coming to faith in Christ is not in and simply of itself an intellectual exercise. It's learning how to love the Lord your God with all of your faculties. Would you invite Christ to come into your heart? Every week we pray the ABCs of prayer letter A stands for God I admit I am a sinner and I have chosen to do wrong and to rebel and I have a sinful nature that has never been changed and I now want to acknowledge I want to have a new nature and become that new person no longer alienated and separated from your grace and your righteousness and your your mercy and if that is your heart then the letter B says that you believe these truths of the gospel the good news that your heart has been hearing and therefore even by your prayer letter C stands for you confess him as your savior if that is your heart admit believe and confess then heaven is rejoicing and celebrating as the gospels teach us that you are coming to the faith for the rest of us there's a sense of awe and there's a sense of even grief because we have come to even a greater clarity as to what our savior has really done for us so as the song begins to sing, take a moment and come to Christ in the way he is speaking to your heart.
Will you lay it there? The Will you come to that foot of the cross? Foot of the cross. At the foot, of the, cross. the foot of the cross. Will you come on there? For my sins, sweet Jesus, paid the cost. I anticipate hearing from you sharing with us how God is working in your heart. You don't even have to wait to fill out the digital communication. You can, you can come up here right now and say, Preacher, this is how God is working in my heart. You can share that with me right now if you would like. We'll invite you to come. Or you can come to this altar and have a little special private moment of prayer. I'm going to ask the band to keep singing. Come on to the foot of the cross. For my sins, sweet Jesus paid the cost. He's a road to salvation. Without him I'd be lost. I lay my burdens down at the foot. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. May the Lord's face shine upon his people. In his name, amen and amen. amen. Thank you for being with us in worship in person and church online. Uh, we'll, uh, the Lord willing, see each other this Wednesday. Table talk at 630. Other than that, enjoy this beautiful weekend and this beautiful weather and uh, take a moment and high-five each other, visit with one another, have a wonderful day. Let us all stand for our closing happy trails. Happy trails to you. It's great to say hello and to share with you this trail. into our hearts and then he freed us for a life that's true a happy trip